Michael G. Shields did pretty well actually to trap it and then runs away. This would be the goal of the day for the Hawks. Well played, young man. Radically a rookie against him, Lewis. Four oh. knockdown. Oh. Shields from Superb. Burgoyne got his arms free, gave it to Shields. He lines them up and he nails it. Spilling ball, Bruce Shields, yeah. another one. Hand stayed down. Isaac Smith the rebounds around from Matt to Shields. The other one who shared so much of the journey puts it through. G'day Hawks fans, how good is this? A very special edition of the Hawk Talk podcast. We were delighted to link up with a three-time Premiership Hawk, 206 games and counting. He is Hawthorne's own tackling machine, leading by example. It is, of course, Liam Shields. Most underrated, not on this podcast. No, not at all. We love Liam Shields here on the Hawk Talk podcast. And uh, we thought it was high time that we took a look at the three-peat a little more closely. It's something that we do in a roundabout way, obviously, every now and again. But uh, I think it was called for that we really put the microscope on what was essentially a golden era for the club. Yeah, it's just great to reminisce about it, isn't it? I think Liam hadn't spent too much time looking back because he's still in the bubble of AFL, but uh, having a little bit of time to himself, he, he gave us the opportunity to have a chat to him about it. And before we get into it, we'd like to thank Liam for his time and, of course, the Hawthorne Football Club for coordinating everything behind the scenes to make this happen. We're very appreciative of that. And uh, it was indeed an absolute pleasure chatting with Liam. Liam Shields, the barometer of the Hawthorne side. <laughs> the most underrated hawk according to your own coach. That's got to be good hearing that. It's nice. I don't think I've ever been described as a barometer before. So That might have been us, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's how it seems whenever you're on the Hawthorne side is, is going beautifully. It's, you can see uh, it just flows through the midfield there. Yeah, I guess um, that's kind of my role a little bit in the side is just, you know, doing the team things. Uh, you know, I'm probably not not a flashy player and don't do, you know, all the specky things that a, a few other players in the side do. So, um, yeah, my role is basically just try to get in there, play, play a role for the side, get an understaff, the tackling, um, the shepherds, the bumps and things like that. So that's what gets you game every week. So that's what I try to do. But you, uh, you would have stood out early because... Um... Well, you're the underage of the of the draft, and we've heard stories about how Hawthorne got an absolute steal. Yeah, I think I made the draft by um, two days. So I was the yeah, 29th of April, and the cutoff was two days later. So um, I think that year was the last year that clubs could have access to 17 year olds, and uh, the club picked up myself, uh, Luke Loudon, and Shane Savage, who were all 17 year olds. So. Um, yeah, I was quite lucky. I still had a year of school to finish off at Aquinas College in Ringwood. So yeah, how, how did that go, juggling that? Oh, yeah, it was the best year of my life. I think um, <laughs> for school, I just told the school that I had uh, footy commitments, and whenever I wanted to get out of you know the recovery session or something like that, I'd tell the footy club that I've got a bit of extra school work to do. So we'll have to let um, get. We had Gary back an hour on last week. We'll have to let Gary know that uh, it actually works quite well for the underages because he wants to raise the draft age in his latest articles. So 2009, synonymous with the playing group being perhaps a bit too content with the 2008 Cup in the cupboard. How was it arriving at the uh, newly crowned premiers? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I was just starstruck when I first walked in. Um, The boys had just won the premiership and, you know, the likes of Buddy Franklin, Luke Hodge, Sam Mitchell, Silverioli, these guys were just absolute um, my idols in a sense. So, Kind of, I kind of just got in there and um, didn't say too much and didn't know a lot about you know how the, the AFL system works. So I you know, just put my head down and got to work. But it wasn't until you know you look back now in hindsight, um, a few guys went into operations a little bit too late. Um, they waited and they celebrated the premise in 2008. Good thing. They, I'm sure they had a good time. But leading into the, the year in 2009, uh, probably didn't help. But well, you didn't waste time, did you? You were. Uh... Gunning it up in Box Hill and then made your debut. You would have been the youngest player in the AFL at that point, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was lucky in a sense. I, I, you know, I definitely probably wouldn't have got those games if um, you know we had a full side. Uh, there was a lot of injuries. Uh, a lot of our senior guys were out. So guys like myself and Ryan Shawmakers, um, Shane Savage. You know, we got games that perhaps we didn't deserve, but um, in the long I think run, it paid out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's culminated in the uh, International Rules Series in 2011, I believe, Tiz. Was that right? Yeah. Now, I brought this up because uh, I, I, I always wonder what the number on your back means. And that 
International Rules Series, you were coached by Rodney Ede, who of course wore 26 for Hawthorne. Does the number on your back, because you started with 26, does that mean something when you get to the club or how do they how do they juggle that? Because at the moment they give you high numbers to the young guys and then they sort of come down into the into the earlier numbers. Does it mean something to you when the history of it, I mean? Yeah, I guess I was probably lucky in a sense and so I was sure that you know, there's a couple of guys that um, left the footy club after 2008 and Zach Dawson was one of them, so the 26 was available. And I think that year, 25, yeah, well, 25 was also available. So Shuey was the first pick we had in the 2008 draft. So he got the lowest number and then I was the second pick. So um, yeah, I was lucky enough to get the number 26, which is a pretty um, you know, famous number at Hawthorne. So Definitely, hello. <laughs> another couple of guns in there that I forgot. So uh, it was quite an honour to wear the number 26 and... Um, throughout my career, I've been offered, you know, the chance to change a couple of times, but never, you know, thought twice about jumping out of the 26 jumper. It's always... I feel for the next number 26 because uh, you've got a hell of a legacy already and you're still playing, you're still going. What what number of games are you at now? You're 206 games and counting, three premierships. Uh, we want to talk about this three, Pete. Um, I mean, let's start the 2013 campaign. You're coming off the ultimate heartache, obviously, having fallen to Sydney. How do you manage everything around that, either as individuals or a playing group? Like, what did you guys do with that? Yeah, I guess uh, 2012 was you know a massive disappointment for us. Um, I felt like we were probably the best side in the competition throughout the whole year and the most consistent. And whatever reason, it didn't work out for us on grand final day, and um, Sydney put up a great show and, and ended up winning the game. And you know, sitting out on the, the ground after that game watching the city players get their medals probably the hardest thing that I've done in football and uh, no doubt spurred us on um, so I always say now you know if, if we didn't lose that game perhaps we wouldn't have come out and, and won the next three so it was kind of you know the hard the hard luck story that we needed to have um, to go on and looking back now helped us it would definitely helped us achieve you know the, the three in a row after that I remember heading off to the summer holidays and I'm driving past uh, the back of um, uh, Rosebud and there's Jordan Lewis doing sprints in 40-degree heat. And I thought, oh, you know, he's he's not happy with the result <laughs> <laughs> if he's out there doing that. Um, it's all the motivation you need is to play in a losing grand final. And all the boys, you know, really took control of their, their own pre-season and um, it was very much player-driven, um, you know, that 2013 pre-season, so... Yeah, definitely, you know, losing that one helped win the next thing. I guess that was going to be my question is how is it dealt with internally? Is it something that the club lingers on for too long or is it really just up to the players to sort of try and get on with things? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, from memory, we went back and, you know, we probably had three or four days after the grand final and then we went through a little bit of vision um, of the game, which is, you know, as I said, sitting out there watching the Sydney players get their medals was, you know, so hard to... And just as a player, you kind of just feel like you want to move on. You don't want to watch it ever again. I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, Parker made us sit through it so we could learn from it. And, you know, that's a tough thing to do. And, um, yeah, now looking back, it definitely you know, drove us for the rest of pre-season. Uh, everyone was highly motivated and uh, worked out well. What happened in approaching that 2013 campaign, strategically speaking? I mean, is Clarko feverishly developing something new or is there still faith in what made Hawthorne so dominant in that 2012 season? Yeah, I guess at that stage we had a pretty uh, solid game plan. Uh, there wasn't too many drastic changes to the way we wanted to play. Um, it was more little, little you know, fine tunings, um, a few little twink uh, tinkers here and there. Um, but yeah, there was nothing, you know, I think over the three or four years that were you know, probably, you know, the best two or three sides in the competition, there wasn't a heap changes to the side and there wasn't a heap of changes to the game plan. It was just, you know, a few little things here or there, a bit of fine tuning, um, you know, a little bit more of a focus on a few different areas. I spoke to Jack Russell one day and he told me that uh, he he felt 2012 was a lot of his fault because everyone basically was stuffed at the end of the year and it was just the one game that he needed everyone up for. So he tinkered a lot with how they did the training throughout the year. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, he was he was one of the masters, Jack, and I think he had us cherry ripe for you know, that last game in September, you know, three years in a row, and I'm, I'm sure that he would have learned a lot from 2012 as we did as players and, you know, as the coaching staff did as well. Heading into the bye in 2013, you've put away most sides pretty handily to that point with the exception of a couple that seriously challenged 
Um, what's the general vibe around the club at that point? Do you start feeling like you're on your way back? Yeah, I think uh, you just kind of want to get to the, the buy in a good position and then reset and really attack the second half of the year. Um, that's what that's what our, our goal was. Um, and, you know, boys normally get away during the buy, play a bit of golf, you know, switch off from footy and know that you've got to run home then to you know, give it your all heading into finals. Now, of course, you had your uh, your own adversity at that time. Isn't that right, Tiz? Uh, yeah, so you... Um, got injured in a 10-goal win over Brisbane and then had to wait till round 22 to come back in, and that would have been um, nerve-wracking. Yeah, it was. I was uh, quite lucky in a sense in 2013. Um, I did syndesmosis in my ankle uh, down in Tassie and I think missed six or seven weeks and then came back for two weeks and I think it was the last game of the season. Um, tweaked it again and had to miss a few weeks, so... At that stage, uh, we were winning every week, so it was a, a tough side to break into, and I was probably, you know, one of the last guys picked. So uh, I was quite a sense that uh, Cyril got injured, I think, had a slight hammy and missed two weeks. I came in for the, the first final and played okay and was lucky enough to hold my spot for the rest. But, yeah, it was a, a very, uh, very nervous time for me. You, you held on for, um, well, I mean, obviously what followed was pretty famous all round, but one of the most famous wins in Hawthorne's history now, uh, beating Geelong finally. I mean, at that point, Geelong, Geelong are essentially Hawthorne's kryptonite for whatever reason. You run into them in the prelim, finally put them away. What do you reckon made this game the one? Like, What sorts of things were played or approached differently to make this the win? Yeah, I think um, just the, the belief in the group. I remember um, the three-quarter time huddle you know, we're all kind of just looking at each other. They kind of, I think, got the older guys together for, you know, 30 seconds, uh, the younger guys together for 30 seconds. And it was like, righto, boys, what are we going to do in this last quarter? And I remember saying the younger guys, just, you know, this is our time just to, to step up a little bit. I'm not sure what the older guys were saying, but it seemed to fire up Sean Burgoyne. <laughs> put the side on his back and, um, yeah, got us over the line in the end. But I think yeah, the, the belief was the massive one. I think we were 22, 23 points down at the time. And we still thought we could win. So without that attitude, um, I don't think we would have won the line at the end. I don't know. Shawnee, he's a freak. That's all. Sean Burgoyne at the uh, the young age of, what would he have been, 32 or 33? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a great night. I was in the stands just, oh, it's terrific. I've never had that atmosphere um, before. And the noise that came was uh, unbelievable and then the siren of course no one heard the siren and did you know out on the ground that that it was all over or no i didn't hear the siren i just i think i looked over and saw a few of the boys celebrating but yeah, it's one of the best wins i've ever been involved in if you go onto youtube if you're ever inclined to be indulgent jump on youtube and there's some uh footage recorded from the stands especially in standing room where eventually you stop watching the play because everyone's going <laughs> mental. You can't see a thing. It's just pure pandemonium. <laughs> so I recommend that if you get some time. Not long to be able to celebrate it, though, realistically, because you've got a grand final. <laughs> Funny that. You win the prelim, you have to get yourself up for the next big game. One thing I noticed in the parade, and one thing I didn't expect, is quite how there was so much support for Fremantle. <laughs> I was really taken aback at... Uh, the purple haze gathering momentum, it got me a little bit concerned. What was the plan for the Dockers heading into this game? Yeah, I think we kind of spoke about that internally as well. Um, you know, all the hype around um, the papers and on the news was around Freo and how good their defence was. So I think that almost come into favourites for the game. We were kind of there sitting, sitting quietly and we looked at the stats and knew that we were you know, a better side defensively than they were. So that was our, you know, our a big focus for the week is like, right, well, let's kind of ambush these guys. Everyone thinks they've got the best defence in the competition, but actually it's us. So kind of use that a little bit. Um, just kind of move from Clarko to use that ex- external height um, to get the finals up. But, yeah, it was a pretty low scoring affair. Probably not the, the prettiest grand final to watch. But Hey, mate, it doesn't stop me watching it on DVD over and over. There's a great <laughs> uh, uh, radio grab of you right after the siren on ABC Radio, just uh, telling everybody how happy you are. It's actually really immediate and oh, it's great. And I, I think I got a high five from you running around the ground that time too. <laughs> Something I wanted to ask, and I feel I know the answer. I feel Tiz knows the answer. I feel all Hawthorne fans might suspect the answer. Does Isaac Smith ever bring up that goal? <laughs> all the time. <laughs> oh, it's a pretty special goal. The celebration was even better. He was, he was off off to the middle of the ground before he stopped 
celebrating. I think I told him just to you know, call the Jets, mate. Hodgie would have been of a huge impact on on you when you arrived at the club too. Just having him in the side directing and what's it like to be? Because Isaac Smith obviously got told to cool it. What's what's it like with Hodgie and and Mitchell there controlling the reins and as a younger bloke, how do you deal with that? Oh yes, you know probably two two of the best leaders the game's ever seen in Hodgie and Mitch, and you know they had a good support crew as well with Jordan Lewis, um, Jared Ruffhead, Josh Gibson, these guys as well. So um, out on the ground, we knew as young fellas that all we had to do was basically worry about ourselves in a sense and just just go and play our role and they'll look after all the structure stuff all the game field stuff um, and if they need anything they'll let you know um, you know they can be quite aggressive in the way they let you know but that's what's needed at the time and um, they'd always follow up and you know, help out throughout the week you know work on your deficiencies and also help like promote your strengths so very lucky to come into a footy club with the likes of Luke Hodge and Sam Mitchell like, there you know steering the ship alongside Clarko. Speaking of playing your role, I happen to notice that between 2013 and 2014, some of your stats go absolutely through the roof. I mean, you more than double your total disposals and your total tackles. You improve on your clearances as well. Are you being deployed differently for this season for 2014? Have you got a new role or what's going on there? Yeah, probably um, you know, given a little bit more responsibility just to, to go through the, the midfield and win my own footy um, up until period of time I hadn't been playing that consistently so I kind of found my niche in the side was as a run with player which I quite enjoyed and was getting me a game every week but um, yeah Clarko kind of came to me and said oh, I feel like you can go to the next level if you give him a little bit more time and responsibility in the guts so that's probably why the, the stats trended up through those years. I guess things would have had to have changed overall I don't want to linger on it too long but you have to talk about Lance Franklin leaving the club it's just an essential narrative of that time um, when did you personally know that he might be out the door? Oh, not not till it happened. I always, you know, thought that he'd hang around. Um, you know, it was all over the papers and things like that. But you know, you like to think that he was going to hang around, and then and then if he did go, he's going to GWS, and you know, that's fine. You know, <laughs> start up club, a pretty young club, um, club that we probably you know, we're going to get the wood over for the next few years when they were developing. But, yeah, the biggest shock for me is that he ended up at Sydney. Strategically speaking, how significant was that? I mean, I imagine a lot would have had to have been changed. Yeah, I think because um, he was such a focal point you know, up forward. I know every time I got the ball running through the midfield, if you put it in Bard's vicinity, he was going to mark it or, or do something special with it. So, and he does stand out. And he, once he puts his arms out and he pulls through it on the lead, you just feel like you have to kick it to him. So you know, I guess it made us a little bit... Um, less predictable going forward. And get the likes of, you know, Ruffy, um, Jack Gunston, like David Hale was there at the time. You know, a little bit more opportunity because the ball was kicked to them more often. And um, you know, our small forwards at the three amigos, I think, you know, grew in that aspect as well that they got more opportunities going forward. But I think, yeah, the big thing was just less predictable. I, I think that rings true because I seem to recall that year there was some side just still putting away by over a hundred points. I think St Kilda at one point. Uh, which is insane to think you're doing that without the best forward in the comp. But one of the big stories um, of that year, I've actually pulled an article from June 10, 2014, so right in the middle of the season. John Ralph pens a piece on Hawthorne writing, What if Monty Python's Black Knight actually won for once? For so long they resembled that much-referenced character, complaining only of a flesh wound despite the loss of both arms and legs. Now, of course, I guess what he's talking about there is the fact that, you know, Gibson goes down, Mitchell, Sewell, Rioli, even Clarko at one point, and your buddyless. Uh, the soldiers are falling. So what is the mentality of the club across this journey? Yeah, I think, I think the saying we used um, internally was uh, forged by adversity. So we had all these things going on off-field and on-field. And I guess every time a little hiccup or you know, happened, it was kind of up to us to bring it closer together as a group so that was kind of our mentality and I guess we kind of embraced the challenge of that um, because there was so much going on I think the advantage that came out of you know all those guys missing so much footy is that you know come the back end of the year and come finals that they were fresh I gotta say I had a fantastic time in round four of that year I went up to the Gold Coast and you guys just missed out on a hundred point win that was a terrific but I think uh, you got injured that night playing on Gary Ablett then you missed a few weeks and and uh, so it, there was a lot of um, inconsistency in personnel at Hawthorne for that whole year. And then you get through that prelim 
against Port Adelaide by a whisker, uh, which would have been nerve-wracking. I mean, all the prelims were pretty much that way. But um, then it's Buddy. Is it all about Bud in the change rooms or in the addresses? Or how much of an impact did having Bud playing for uh, Sydney have on the psyche of the other players? Yeah, uh, Bud wasn't spoken about too much at all internally. It was, um, if anything, you know, speaking about the 2012 grand final, how Sydney got over the top of us and we, we owed him one. But, um, yeah, Bud, we just treated Bud like, you know, he was one of, you know, another player wearing the, the red and white. Um, you know, we didn't want to, to, to distract us too much at all. So, yeah, I think that the, the big driving factor was that they'd beaten us in, in 2000 and. 2012. And, and then Burgoyne goes back with a fly to the ball in the first couple of minutes and then Lakey puts his arm through the back of his head a few minutes later. It's <laughs> I love that, seeing that out on the on the ground, you know, and your defenders are doing that against everyone else up. Well, he'd had a similar moment with um, Michael Walters in uh, in 2013, which the umpire ignored. Um... <laughs> the longest man I've ever met, Brian Lake. Really? And he knows all the pressure points and how to wrestle, so... Um, yeah, no, I'm not inclined to myself. <laughs> I'll give that a hard pass. You played on that day like a team that really had its blood boiling for two years. Is that kind of how it felt? You, you owed them a lot, a hell of a beating, and you delivered. Like, was that really like front and center in, in your mind? Like, we are going to absolutely smack them today. Yeah, I think going into the game, everyone was pretty fired up, and you know, it was just one of those days where everything clicked. Um, Everything just went right for us. You know, it couldn't have worked out better. But yeah, no doubt we'll fight up from 2012. And I think, you know, we looked a little bit into the history of Hawthorne, you know, the 88, 89 back to back. And we wanted to do that as well. So uh, you had a video. It was at the start of that final series. It was Jason Dunstall presented some sort of video to you that was supposed to inspire you. Am I getting that series right? Or Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I can't remember it that clearly. But yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, you're still, when you're still playing, you don't really go back and reflect too often. We kind of learn after 2008. That- yeah, let's take it one game at a time, one game at a time. But there, there'd be room for big celebrations. There were, there's fantastic photos of you guys walking through the crowd and high-fiving either side of you. And Yeah, I think the 48 hours post when a, a grand final is uh, some of the best fun I'll have in my life, I think. What, what was it that you attempted to do for the Sydney game? Because, I mean, as you say, like you hit every note perfectly. It was, it just went according to plan. But what was the plan? Yeah, to be honest, I can't remember exactly what it was. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> On that day, I just remember our, our Hawks ball and the way we moved the ball is probably the best we've done in a long time. And I think in 2012, that's probably the thing that we didn't do too well. I mean, defensively, we're okay. But um, offensively, with how we use the ball, I was a little bit predictable. Um, I guess didn't take too many risks. So going into the 2014 game, we knew that if we used the ball you know, properly and took a few more risks, we could really open up Sydney, and that's what we. And there were some, um, what would you say, risky plays that were really well rewarded in that game. Like uh, Langford, for instance, he just took took them on at every opportunity. He was outstanding all through the, the 2014 finals campaign, and then I think he popped up and kicked three goals on. In front of and had 20 on touches. And it was a pretty, you know, special effort. But he's not centering the ball. He's he's just <laughs> having a ping. You know, he's just he's just backing himself, isn't he? That that's kind of what you're talking about. That one that bounced over, you know, the Sydney player's head on the line. It was just you know, unbelievable that he would even have a shot from there, and then it worked out. So pretty cool, pretty lucky. Yeah, I, I should just step in at this point and say, Tiz, you could lay off the guy. I mean, does it get more centre than through the big sticks? That is centering the ball. <laughs> There's another uh, great player who claims to be centering the ball in the grand final. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are blessed with so many highlights. and We're still stuck on 2014. We're still at 2015 to go which uh, was panning out to be a pretty interesting year to begin with. Um, I say interesting as supporters, we were probably tearing our hair out. <laughs> the first half was a bit of a roller coaster in terms of results. What is the feeling around the club at that time as far as, you know, having faith that you can climb that mountain again? Yeah, I think maybe you know, we'd had played in so many big games and, you know, quite coming off the back of two grand finals, playing in front of 20,000 at the MCG, maybe didn't get the, the players up. You know, the guys that have played 
250 games at the time. Um, we're just hanging out to get to finals again. And I think, you know, the feeling amongst the group was no matter where we finish in the eight, as long as we make the eight, that we're a good chance of winning the flag. Because come September, we've got big game players. That was borne out in the stats too, because you'd, you'd see the contested possessions. And Clarko would be roped by the media for looking at this, you know, ignoring contested and, and all this kind of stuff. And he'd tell them we don't really track that and that that kind of stuff. And then come finals, it'd skyrocket that uh, percentage. So it, there definitely was a change in mindset from the players then. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're just hanging out to get to finals that year. Um, and they're lucky enough. I think we finished, we finished top four in the end. Went over to Perth and played... Got smashed and then went back the next couple of weeks and had a good win. Yeah, I remember Frawley lining up at full forward in that game and thinking, oh, <laughs> Clarko's lost it. <laughs> uh, are there any occasions, because I mean, it's so often with the supporter base that uh, I think the catch cry is, in Clarko we trust. It's whenever we see something that might be a bit suspect, we're like, oh, I don't really know about that. There'll always be one fan that chimes in and goes, don't doubt the great man. What about you guys as players? Are there ever any times, maybe when he gets the guitar out, where you're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> He's had the guitar out a couple of times on Zoom, I think. <laughs> His work ethic and passion for the game is second to none. So whatever he comes up with, you know that he's put a lot of thought into it, a lot of research into it. So you kind of, as players, have to back it in. And um, most of the time he's right too, which helps. <laughs> He's got the record to prove it by now. A good track record. What is your personal favourite win of the three, Pete? I mean, that's got to be a tough question, I know. Um, but do you have a personal favourite victory? Yeah, I liked the, the 2014 game. I think, as I said, everything just clicked that day. It was not perfect football. Um, the way we moved the ball, able to share it around. Um, I think it was just every, a great team performance. Everyone played well on the day. And, you know... As I touched on at the start, you know, it was pretty pretty hard to watch Sydney get their, their medals at the end of 2012, so it was nice to be able to get one back on them. Yeah, trying to do the three-peat justice in one podcast is going to be impossible. And uh, besides, we want to talk about what's been happening recently at the club as well. Um, Tiz, it'd be remiss of us not to mention uh, the big milestone game. Oh, yeah, the 200th. Did you enjoy that, Liam? <laughs> I had a cracking day. Couldn't have worked out. Couldn't have worked out better. Well, it did seem like the group was uh, playing for you. You got the second goal of the game with a classic bit of tap ruck work from McAvoy. Just a beautiful goal. It just seemed like the boys lifted. You were in front at every change, and I think you kicked another goal in late in the third quarter um, from a similar thing, but that was uh, Mitch Lewis's tap down. Yeah, the, the ruckman looked after me that day, which is which is nice. Um, but, yeah, I think in all our milestone games we played last year, you know, we were able to get wins so while uh, big boy played a 200th. Isaac played a 200th, and Luke Bruce played a 200th, and we had a win in all of them. So definitely, I think you know when there is a milestone game on, the, the boys you know, want to get up and lift for those games. More than a few beers after the game as well, so a lot better after a win. Are you running off Dangerfield beautifully? Or not? <laughs> yeah, I covered pretty well. I want to ask you, Liam, who, in your opinion, is the most exciting youngster at Hawthorne right now? The prospect that. We really want to watch and why. Yeah, I've really liked, um, you know, there's a few guys that were brought into the footy club that have had fantastic pre-seasons. Emerson Jecker, um, you know, but the, the one guy is probably Will Day that stands out for a smooth mover. Uh, we took him with our first pick uh, last year. And, you know, off half-back, uses the ball, you know, really nicely. Um, well, similar to Andrew Mackey in a sense, I guess. I don't like to use your own players too often, but... Um, you know, yeah, he's, he needs to put on a little bit of size, but I think you know he, he reads the game really well and his foot skills are outstanding as well. So he's one to look forward to. We were out there at the practice game and he just seemed to pick up the ball at, at will and dispose of it as he liked. And Yeah, he's one of those guys that um, always looks like they've got time on their hands when they're out there. Nothing's rushed and you know, they're always cool, calm and composed and making good decisions. That round one game, uh, how do you reflect on it now? It's, it's a bit of an oddity, isn't it? But uh, how's the feeling of being out there and good to get the win, obviously? Yeah, it was good. Um, I, I think our pre-season form wasn't great going into that game and then um, we were able to lift for round one. We kind of embraced um, the no crowd and what was going on outside and just thought, let's enjoy it. Let's own the energy out on the field, which we were able to do. And as we touched on earlier, Isaac Smith is... Fantastic in that sense. He's always you know, up and about. And I think he kicked the first goal of the game and had a 
that big celebration, that kind of got us going a little bit. But, um, you know, we worked out that the fans definitely make the game. It's uh, nowhere near as good playing out there on the MC. No one there. I don't want to pay out on Isaac again, but um, you could tell he was really suffering. <laughs> <laughs> when he slotted that goal, he really wanted to celebrate and he just couldn't. And my heart went out to him. Yeah. <laughs> that was a celebration more than anyone. So the the club's bringing, bringing you all back for Monday, is that right? The training's up and going? and I think we're still waiting on an announcement from the AFL. So I think today or tomorrow at some stage, they're going to you know, come out and announce that. We're hoping to be back by Monday, but we're still, we're still unsure what the goal is. Customary question as we, we look to wrap up here. I, I think it's becoming a staple of our interviews <laughs> it might seem a bit odd but uh how are you liam how's things how are you going yeah i'm good i'm uh yeah, love and life uh getting married in november hopefully if everything plays out the way it should i really miss footy but you know, i really enjoyed isolation um, something different I've spent a bit of time with my fiance um, which i don't see a heap you know, just because she works at night she's a dance teacher and i'm you know, kind of ships in the night when I'm getting home. So isolation's been good, but I'm, you know, definitely looking forward to getting back out there. And there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel now, which is which is good and exciting to catch up with someone in real life and have a kick of the footy would be nice. It's good that you've been able to pluck a silver lining from it. And I guess just by your tone, it sounds like you're excited about the club generally and what, what we're trying to do going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, after round one, you know, had a pretty solid performance. You know, I think we'll almost have a full healthy list now getting, you know, Jars and Blake Hardwick and a few of these guys that have had long-term injuries um, back now that they've had, you know, six or seven weeks off. And um, we've got a great dynamic at the footy club. We've put in a heap of hard work over the pre-season and, you know, we've stayed connected during this period. And I think one of the strengths of our footy club is, you know, we, we look after each other and we stick fat and we normally adapt and embrace situations like this better than most sides. And, um, you know, as we touched on before with Clarko, he's, he's always working and um, his passion for the game is second to none. So I'm sure he's come out with the master plan and when we get back out there, we can uh, implement. It'll be an incredible um, premiership if it, if it goes through, won't it? It'll, some people say it'll be asterisks, but... Um... To me, it's like the ultimate, you have to adapt to ever-changing conditions through this period, and it's just so much harder, I would imagine, to win this. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be pretty cool to say you were the team that won it, um, you know, the year that COVID-19 um, affected the season. And as you said, it's going to take you know, the team that best adapts and embraces the situation um, to win it this year. Was there anything you wanted to make mention of? I know you've got a couple of things on the go. Oh, I've got me Cuzzy hat on. Cuzzy Performance is just a um, you know a little performance centre out in Roeville where I grew up, so only five minutes from the footy club. Um, so it's similar to you know an F45 setup where we run hit classes, one-on-one PT. I do a little bit of footy mentoring stuff with a few younger kids, and we've also got you know Pilates and physio there, so that that keeps me busy away from footy. And it's been handy during this isolation period that I can go and lift some weights there as well. We saw Tom Mitchell's. Uh thing he's put together see i model myself after tom mitchell but mostly it's just the shapes <laughs> <laughs> well liam uh, i speak for all hawthorne fans i'm sure and i say uh, we can't wait for you to get back to to what you love doing i think that's something that uh, people might take for granted is this is not just a job it's something you clearly enjoy doing as well and the way things are it's shaken up your life it's shaken up everyone's life and I guess just as a community of fans, we're all right behind you and we can't wait to see you back out there again. Thanks very much. And you know, thanks for all the Hawks fans that have stuck with us. Uh, we can't wait to get back out there. And uh, yeah, we're very lucky that we've got such loyal supporters out there. Well, there it is, Liam Shields. What a pleasure it was chatting with the uh, three-time Premiership Hawk, 206 games and... It's going to go on with it later this year, hopefully. Yeah, I don't think he could feel underrated anymore, could he, Nick? I mean, we talked him up, but uh, it's very straight batty plays, isn't it? It's very much, <laughs> I played my role. He wasn't having it. Yeah, it's wonderful to um, to meet sportsmen who who have that kind of um, view of themselves and, and, and have the ego for it, but also don't need to project it there. I can't say I'm surprised. Uh, the way he goes about it on the footy field and, and off it, it seems, as well, he's... He's a, he's a quiet operator, but he's super dependable. I mean, for so long now, for so many years, he's just been an essential key component of this Hawks lineup, and uh, and from a young age too. Yeah, from a young age. Um, he's controlled. He's methodical. He's just so dependable. As a supporter, watching him out there on the ground, 
You never have any worries when Shields has the ball or is around the contest. He has some phenomenal numbers in terms of when he's at when he's at the contest. Yeah, consider that, Hawks fans. That is an absolute luxury that you don't get with too many players. Uh, certainly other teams don't feel it. <laughs> oh, it's great fun to have that access from the Hawthorne Footy Club, and we thank them a lot. Well, that is something we should do again, Tiz, is thank Liam for his time and indeed the club for uh, coordinating everything behind the scenes to make it happen. Um, this was an absolute thrill for us, and uh, we very much enjoyed it. And... I'm getting real excited about EJ. Oh, Emerson Jacker, yeah, I, I like that. And Will Day. Yeah, it seems the club might have put that uh, pick 13 to good use, Tiz. So it's all of us that can't wait for footy to be back. Liam's itching to go. We're getting a little, you know, excited. We might be able to watch it on the telly again, but it's not going to be the same as actually being there. No, that's right. In the meantime, uh, be sure to keep up with us on all the social media platforms. Hey, if you enjoyed this, if you really loved this episode... Uh, what you can do is jump on Apple Podcasts and uh, rate and review us there. We'd love to hear from you if you enjoyed this episode. Uh, Twitter as well, at HawkTalkPod on Twitter. We've uh, surged past 2,000 followers and what a community we've built there. And don't forget Facebook. Yes, of course, facebook.com slash HawkTalkPod and uh, the big one, patreon.com slash HawkTalkPod. If you feel like uh, slinging us a little bit of coin, uh, support the show we'd really appreciate that actual player on the pod this was a this was a goal this year and we've ticked it off going to be honest with you mate I'm still buzzing a bit <laughs> it's been a good run for the podcast of late superb guest after superb guest and uh, you know, we have no intentions of slowing down fantastic Nick talk to you tomorrow mate oh yes the week's <laughs> only just begun for the Hawk Talk podcast we are a happy team at Hawthorne